Well, good morning. Thank you, and this is a good one. You know, reading this text this week, and I had a laugh because normally I like to think the best of people. I mean, it's it's what I'm trained to do, of course. Um, but honestly, it's an easier way to live. I, I look at my job as giving people all the rope they need to hang themselves and pray that they don't ever find a tree. So uh, what I'm doing when I read this is I'm doing that to the Pharisees. I go along through the scriptures and I think, man, if I was a Jew and I had been raised in this tradition and I had been taught that this is what was good and right and holy about life, and then some upstart came along and was telling me now that it was going to be turned on its ear, which is exactly what Jesus was doing. He was raised in that tradition, but he was telling him no longer was this going to be the way we're going to live. We're going to live this way. Now, I'd probably react much as they did. I like change, but I like change in the sense that I set my boundaries and then I go play them in between the fences. The Pharisees are kind of that way, and so I try to give them the benefit of the doubt. I try to think the best of them, but there's no way I can do that today. If you read this, they're looking to catch Jesus in a trap. And they ask him straight up, you know, and, and man, I, I love Jesus' wit. He asks them, <laughs> they, they say, tell us, is it, is this lawful to pay taxes to the emperor? Now, you know what's behind this, right, is this idea of the first commandment. Those of you that have been through confirmation, remember the first commandment? What is it? I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods. And so paying taxes to the emperor could be construed as, well, we're putting the emperor above God. Well, Jesus knows what they're doing. <laughs> so don't overlook this, he says, show me a coin. And one of those knuckleheads had a coin in their pocket. Well, okay, if you're a good Jew, one of the first things you know is you don't have any graven images. <laughs> so here they are in the, in the temple with, with a graven image of the emperor in their pocket. So uh, you don't we need to understand a little bit about that, but you read this and in just kind of subtle ways, Jesus was counting coup on him right there because as soon as they showed him the coin, he had him. They were busted. But he goes ahead and he answers their question anyway. And the upshot is, give to the emperor what belongs to the emperor, give to God what is God's. And it begs the question for me, what does belong to God? Does this pew belong to God? Well, of course, it's in God's house. Well, how about that nice motorcycle out there, Mr. Westgore? Does that belong to God? Yes, it does. How about that, that little black truck that the pastor really likes? It's that, that keeps on rolling and he's able to fix it and he has a lot of good afternoons in the, in the garage fixing it. Does that belong to God? Yes, it does. Even though I paid for it, it's the Lord that gave me the energy and the will and the intelligence, although that's debatable, I suppose, to, 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 to do the work, to be paid to buy it. So this is kind of a, uh, an interesting topic. Give to the emperor what belongs to the emperor, but give to the Lord what belongs to the Lord. So this has been used as a stewardship text, you know, throughout all the ages. And I've got to tell you, I've always been not a believer in stewardship sermons. And I know it's going to go against the grain for some of you, and that's okay. But I have never in 18 years seen a church that has been harangued into giving by all the, 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 the quoting of the scriptures that talk about giving. For instance, we talked this past week about Proverbs chapter 3. And uh, there's, a, there's a verse there in Proverbs chapter 3 that says, uh, Give to the Lord from your first fruits." And your barns will be filled, and your vats bursting with wine. And every time I've, I've read this with a group of people, it just, it just kind of goes over their head. So you're never going to convince me that standing up in front of a group of people and haranguing them with the texts of Scripture, it becomes a test of wills is what it does. Wear us down, Pastor, and we'll open our wallets. This has nothing to do with money. Give to the emperor what belongs to the emperor. Give to God what belongs to God. What belongs to God? What does I, what do you have and I have that God actually wants? Larry Burkett's got this cool 
uh, saying. He says, uh, <laughs> he owns the cattle on the hills and he owns the hills too. He owns it all. What do we have that God could possibly want? It's a good question. Go back into Jesus' lesson to the Pharisees here. Back into your own knowledge of, of the law and that first commandment. I am the Lord your God. You'll have no other gods before me. What do we have that God could possibly want? Not our money. Maybe our time. Maybe our talents. Yeah, God can go to work with those. But what God wants is to be first in our lives. The Lord of our heart. The Lord of our mind, such that our mind and our heart seek the way of the Lord. That's what we're talking about in Proverbs here. There's, a, there's the way of wisdom and there's the way of the fools. And in the middle are the simple. The fools are the ones that are going to work against God at every turn. And some of us, or all of us, are guilty of that some of the time. But all of us are also some of the time wise. We're, you know, in Latin, simul justus et precar, simultaneously, a saint and sinner. And so there's this battle in our lives and, and as we get better at it, we learn to follow the way of wisdom, to give God our, our heart and line up our thinking so that our, our lives, our words, and our actions, they match, they look authentic. But then there's the simple. And in Proverbs, we talk about the simple as the one who's on the fence. They don't really want to put forth the effort to do what's required to learn, but yet they're really kind of lazy too. And, you know, being, being bad might be fun, but it takes a lot of work because you've got to cover your tracks and all that. So they're right down the center. What do we have that God could possibly want? He wants our hearts. Here's the problem. When you have things in your life that are between you and God, it messes up that line of communication. I know you're going to roll your eyes, but I'm going to tell you anyway because I'm the pastor and it's part of the sermon. Money is not a God, right? Right. Sex is not a God, right? Power is not a God. Fame. Popularity is not a God. Well, I'm going to be giving us the benefit of the doubt here, but good looks are not a God. I must have offended you. didn't laugh. It's okay. God is God. When we put anything between us and the Lord, the communication gets messed up. If I want to talk to Joel in the back, what I can do is I can go over here to Malcolm and I can give Malcolm the message and he can turn back to Oli and give the message to Oli and Oli can turn back to Ray and Ray can turn back and go all the way back and Joel can get the message that way and if the message was something cryptic like the rain in, play, in Spain falls mainly in the plain, who knows what Joel is going to get by the time it gets back there. If I want to talk to Joel, I can just say, hey Joel, can you turn off that light? Because it's in my eyes. No, don't do that. But you see how that works? If Joel is God and I'm trying to talk to God and there's other things in the way, other gods in my life, money, sex, power, fame, all those other, you know, anger, uh, revenge, all the things that we like to, to chase after in our world, it's like trying to get a message to Joel through all of these people. It doesn't work so good. It's cumbersome. It's highly ineffective. And if you think about your relationship with God, it messes up those lines of communication. It's going to mess up how you see God. Because if you see God from the perspective of, of, uh, of also holding money up right in God's place, God's always going to be having this aura of dollar signs around him. And so everything you, you learn and you think about God is going to be tainted by money or whatever it is that is your God. We walk through our days and God reveals himself to us 
time after time and in place after place and mostly small ways so that we put that mosaic together, those pictures together, and it forms a mosaic of, of, a, of a loving and gracious God. But if, if there's something else that we hold before God, it's going to mess that picture up. Not only that, that picture, it's going to interfere with, with how you hear God. If, if there is another God in the place of the true God, how are you going to hear God's voice, the still small voice? God, God doesn't shout. He doesn't have a microphone, unfortunately. But how are you going to hear that, that quiet voice? <coughs> Excuse me. That comes through and says, Hey, do you really want to do that? Have you thought about maybe being the first to apologize? It messes that all up. And here's the hard one. If there are other gods in place of the one true God, it may even affect how God can work physically in your life. Do you ever think of that? How can we chase after popularity and, and, and fame and good looks and, and wealth and all those other things that we go after and at the same time expect that when we're setting these up to be gods, that the, the real God is going to hear us when we ask, Lord, come into my life. I need you here now. Bring your peace. Bring your healing hand. It doesn't work like that. And Jesus is smart. Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's. In other words, folks, Pay your taxes to the government. I know that's not what you want to hear. But you know what? The fourth commandment sets that up as well. We're to obey our parents, our mother and our father, and others in authority over us. Well, the government is our elected authority. They say we pay taxes. Guess what? Jesus is in support of that. But give to God what is God's. Give Him your heart. Let your mind come into line with what your heart feels. Put some logic to it. There was a, a commercial. I don't wear sandals, but I had a pair of these sandals, and they were great. The, the, those sandals that had that, what was they, Tevas, I think? I don't know. Sandals don't work in my life because with stuff that I do, I mean, I ended up with 10 broken toes. So, you know, I like them because, you know, it's cool and all that, but, you know, my feet look like two little white fish on the, on the ground and it just doesn't work. But the commercial was cool. It said, free your feet. Your mind will follow. So I got a pair of these sandals for my birthday one time and I wore those things out. They were great. And it's true. But if you free your heart... Give your heart to God, everything else in your life will fall into line. Your giving, your, your needs, and even your wants. Pharisees didn't understand that. They were wrapped up in this idea that Jesus was going to be someone that they had to trap and contain. When in truth, God sent him into the world to let grace out and to let love free and to let God be known among every person. So give to the emperor what is the emperor's, but I want you to pay attention this week especially to living each day in a way where you give to God what belongs to God. Give him your heart. Everything else will fall into line. We'll continue.